There's an old song that's familiar to all of us that we oftentimes sing called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I've also posted uh, this song on our Lawson Road Church of Christ Facebook page, and it's also on our YouTube channel. And I would encourage you to, uh, in connection with this brief lesson, to listen to that song and uh, Focus not just on the melody, but on the words themselves, because they're certainly in harmony with what the scriptures teach about the friendship of Jesus with his followers. We read in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I suggest to you that Jesus Christ is that friend. There's an interesting passage in the 15th chapter of the book of John when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and they've been following him now for quite some time and, and uh, listening to his teaching and beholding the miracles that he performed uh, designed to create faith in him as the Son of God. And in John chapter 15 and verse 15, Jesus said, From this time on, I call you no more servants, but I call you friends. I call you friends. That must have been a great source of encouragement to them. Those words must have been uh, such that it made them feel even closer to him than they already did. Think about that word friend for a moment. What do you think of? What what comes to mind when you think of a friend, close friend, maybe even a best friend? I believe we think of someone that, uh, that truly loves us, that loves us unconditionally in spite of our flaws. You think of someone who will not leave us. They'll be there for us every step of the way. And if we're going through difficulties, if we're going through some type of uh, difficulty or problem in our lives, that friend can be counted on to help us, to speak to us words of encouragement, to console us. That friend will never leave us. So you think of the word friend, and, and, uh, and it certainly is one of the most beautiful words in the English language. I want us to think in this brief study about the friendship that we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that, uh, that again, Jesus is a friend to his followers, to those who obey him. As a matter of fact, in that same context that, uh, that I read from a moment ago in John chapter 15 and verse 15 and verse 14, Jesus said, ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. And so there you have the condition set forth by the Lord for an individual to be able to meet in order for that person to truly be a friend of Jesus. And that is we have to obey him. We have to do what he says in his word. As our friend, Jesus is able to do for us some things that no one else is able to do. Think about that for a moment. He's able to do some things that, that no one else can. Now, there's certainly value in friendship, and, um, and we would not de-emphasize any aspect of, of uh, friendship as it relates to people whom we know and people whom we are close to. You think of uh, of our spouse, and that certainly, you know, whether you're talking about a husband or a wife, uh, we certainly should be able to say that uh, she is my best friend. Or if I'm speaking to some ladies, your husband should be your best friend. You may think of others uh, whom you know, maybe someone you work with, maybe just a, a, a friend that you're very, very close to. And so there's value in friendship. But I want to tell you, though, that Jesus, as our friend, can do some things for us that no one else 
is able to do. I'm talking spouse. I'm talking uh, any other family member or relative or, or uh, any other friend that we might have. Jesus is able to do some things for us that no one else can as our friend. I want us to think about just a few of these. First of all, Jesus is our friend because he saves us from sin. Now, to truly appreciate that, we need to have an understanding of the seriousness of sin and the enormity of the problem of sin. We find in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 2 that it is our sins that separate us from God. Our sins cause us to be estranged from God. And so when we, when we think about that, we're able to realize how horrible sin is, especially if it separates us from the one who loves us more than anyone else could, anyone else could ever love us. Sin is, uh, is a, a horrible thing. So Jesus saves us from our sins. That's the, that's the express purpose for which he came into the world. In Luke 19, in verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Just think, man was lost and dying in sin. Jesus left the glories of heaven and came to a sin-cursed earth and lived among men and finally went to the cross and <clears throat> died for us, shed his blood for us in order to save us from our sins. As Jesus was coming to John the baptizer to be baptized of him, John pointed to him in John 1 and verse 29 and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God. In Matthew 26 and 28, Jesus was, uh, he was gathered together with his disciples as they were observing the Passover feast and he used this opportunity to establish his memorial supper and he said in verse 28 for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins and you think about that again it um, it certainly should should move us and and touch our hearts to know that in the lost state in which we were in, when we obeyed the gospel, Jesus saved us from our sins. We'll talk more about that as we conclude our study in just a few moments. But there's a second thing that we need to understand, and that is Jesus is our friend because he guides us in our lives every step of the way. He pictured himself as the good shepherd in the 10th chapter of the book of John, the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And we also find in the scriptures that, uh, that these men whom he chose to be his apostles, those who would carry on his work after he ascended back into heaven, those who would preach and teach his word, he provided guidance for them through the Holy Spirit, didn't he? We find in the scriptures that he tells them that, uh, that he will send the comforter of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit would guide them into all truth and bring all things to their remembrance, whatever he had said to them, and that he would teach them all things and show them things to come that is revealed truth to them. And we find this in John chapter 14 and verse 26 and John 16 and verse 13. And he guides us today through his word. He guided the apostles by uh, sending the Holy Spirit to them. The Holy Spirit inspired them so that when they preached the word of God audibly or wrote it as we have today, the written New Testament, that every word was indeed inspired. It was the word of God. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so through this word, Jesus guides us. He guides us. He said 
in John 6 and verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. The words that he speak, they are life-giving words. They provide spiritual life to those who accept those words and obey those words. And so he continues to guide us. And we find in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And so Jesus guides us, even today, through his word. But then, thirdly, think about this. Jesus is our friend because, yes, he is with us in our trials. And that's important to us, isn't it? We're going to have problems. We know that. Christians are not immune to the problems and the, uh, the difficulties of life. James wrote in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations or trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. We have, <clears throat> we have difficulties. We face problems sometimes on a daily basis, but we have the promise of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Lord is with us, providing the strength that we need. And of course, as we read and study his word and make application of his word to our lives, we find that we become even stronger spiritually. Jesus is our friend in all the seasons of life or all situations of life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, the apostle Paul was giving a defense for his faith. And he said, at my first answer or defense, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. And then he went on to say, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Oh, that must have been invaluable to Paul to know that the one who really counted was with him, that he was with, he was with Paul. We read in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Casting all your care, your anxiety upon him, for he careth for you. Yes, the Lord truly, truly cares for us. But then finally, Jesus is our friend because he gives us victory. Victory is an important word in our language. It's one that we can truly appreciate, especially those who have played uh, sports from time to time. And there may be young people uh, who are watching this video uh, who have been involved in various uh, sports, maybe basketball or baseball or football. And you can understand the importance and the, uh, uh, and the, the great feeling of victory when you're when you're able to come out on top and you've defeated your opponent in whatever game, uh, in whatever sport you might be playing in, you can, you can truly appreciate that. Well, let me tell you something. You and I are engaged in a battle, in spiritual warfare. Paul mentions this warfare in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul pictures the Christian as a soldier. He's a soldier because he's in a battle. He's in, he's in a, a war, in warfare. That's why you have Paul saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he, he goes on and and he mentions the different parts of the Christian armor, the helmet of salvation, the the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, 
of the sword of the Spirit, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. All of these parts of the Christian armor is equally important. And if we follow those instructions, then the Lord guarantees us victory. How great it is to know that, that whatever we face in life of a, of a negative uh, from a negative aspect, that it cannot separate us from the Lord if we are his faithful people. We read in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and, and 39, Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the latter part of that chapter, verses 51 through 57, where the Lord guarantees us victory, even over death, even over death itself. He says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 51, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And he goes on to say that this, in, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. So yes, even, even victory over death. What a friend we have in Jesus. You should sing that song. Think about the words. Focus on the words, the meaning of the song itself. Jesus is our friend because he saves us from sin, because he guides us in our lives through his word, because he is with us even in our trials through the difficulties of life. And he gives us the final victory. But you must be a follower of Christ. That's absolutely imperative. The gospel is preached in Acts chapter 2. This was the first time the gospel was preached as directed by the Lord in the great commission that he gave to his apostles. It's the day of Pentecost. And thousands of Jews were gathered together there in the city of Jerusalem. The Apostle Peter preached the gospel to them. They were convicted of their sins. And they ask in Acts 2, in verse 37, what shall we do? What shall we do? Peter's answer to them by inspiration was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's what an individual has to do in order to become a Christian. That's in harmony with what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. But then it's important that we be faithful to him. Again, in, in the words of Jesus in John 14, 15, you're my friends if you keep my commandments. Keep his commandments. Follow his teaching. Follow him. Follow his word every day that we live upon this earth.